you are visiting this morning, we're very glad to have you with us. If you haven't been here in a while, uh, we are going through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, this is a passage about kingdom living in a broken world. How King Jesus radically transforms us from the inside out. And uh, we are about two-thirds of the way through And this morning, we get to look at a particular passage that is potentially the most quoted verse in all of Scripture. It's not John 3.16. Some of your minds may have assumed John 3.16. It's a very well-known verse, quoted often, but that's not the one we're looking at today. It also is not Philippians 3.14, I can do all things through Christ, because everybody quotes that and applies it to whatever they want to accomplish. The one that we're looking at this morning is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, and it's the verse that starts by saying, judge not. I don't have statistics to prove it. But I think you could argue this is both the most quoted and most misused verse, potentially, in all of Scripture. And so we're going to look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 this morning. Let's read our passage together before we dive in today. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before the pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Let's pray. God, as we open your holy word this morning, we ask for your spirit's guidance and your spirit's illumination that we may understand the truths in this passage. We recognize this morning that your word is living and active and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing soul and sunder and discerning the thoughts and intents of our heart. We just pause this morning to recognize that we need that type of work happening in our hearts and in our minds on a daily basis. And so we invite you, we invite your spirit, we invite your word to have their way in us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, verses 1 and 2 start us off in this passage with, which, with the exhortation of judge not. These two words that oftentimes we stop at, we don't get to the rest of the passage, but this is the exhortation, judge not. And we could probably spend our whole entire morning today talking about what judge not doesn't mean. All of the ways that this text can be misconstrued and used and twisted in ways that are not true. And I'll just mention one of those ways, maybe the most common way, is that people will say, don't judge me. And what they're really saying by saying, don't judge me, is don't tell me what I can and cannot do. Sometimes you don't even have to say anything in order for them to say, don't judge me. You simply don't have to participate in a particular activity that they may be engaging in, and just by your abstinence from that particular activity, they suddenly will say, hey, you think you're better than me? You're judging me because I do this? 
It used to be that when somebody says, don't judge me, they simply want you to tolerate or accept their sinful choices. They don't want to be told that it's wrong. Now, it's to the point where if you not only don't tolerate, but also actually don't celebrate with them in their sinful lifestyle, now that's the standard. Where if you're not actually celebrating with other people in their sinful choices, then, well, you're scum. You deserve to be canceled. You're a terrible human being. And notice what they have just done. They now are judging you. So now we're in a pickle. Who's doing the judging? What's really going on? What we know emphatically from God's word is that judge not is not talking about tolerating or celebrating sinful decisions. In fact, Christians should participate in acts of judgment and discernment every single day. In fact, everybody does, actually, whether you're a Christian or not, you're constantly involved in acts of judgment and discernment. In fact, later on in this passage, in verse 5, He says, first take the log out of your own eyes so that you will then see clearly in order to address the speck in your brother's eye. So we are actually called to address sin in other people's lives. Furthermore, verse 6, Jesus goes as far as to label certain people as dogs and pigs. I'd say that's a judgment call. A very drastic and intense one but a judgment call nonetheless. God's word exhorts us to confront sinful actions. 1 Corinthians 5 is a book written to a church in Corinth that was basically normalizing or becoming callous to very depraved forms of immorality. And Paul, Paul says it should not be this way. You need to confront that. Matthew 18 says, If a brother sins against you, tell him his fault. If he doesn't repent, go and grab another witness and go to him again and tell him his fault. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, If anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of gentleness. And that spirit of gentleness is perhaps a key phrase in how we go about addressing these things. So we are to confront sinful actions. We also are to discern truth from error. 1 John 4 verse 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. You should be testing everything that you hear. Even what comes out of my mouth, you should be testing. You should be Bereans, as it were, and studying the scriptures daily to make sure what you're hearing aligns with truth and is not error. So there's a lot of things that judge not doesn't mean. So what what does it mean? What is Jesus talking about here in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 when he says judge not? The definition that I've come up with is harsh, self-righteous, hypocritical, unwarranted criticism towards others. I would encourage you to stop and, and kind of take a step back from Matthew 7 verses 1 through 6 and remember where we've been in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember what Jesus has been harping on for the last several paragraphs is these people who are outwardly righteous but inwardly Their hearts are far from God. They're giving to the poor, but they're doing it for show. They want to be recognized. They're praying, but once again, they just want the recognition. They don't care about the relationship. They're even fasting, but they're doing it in such a way that others will praise them for their righteousness. He has been 
confronting this spiritual hypocrisy and this harsh, self-righteous, prideful, hypocritical, unwarranted criticism towards others is what we're talking about here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. In Luke 18, 9, it says, Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous because of what they were doing, and they treated others with contempt. So we know from other passages of Scripture that these scribes and Pharisees that Jesus has been addressing in chapter 6 and presumably now again in chapter 7 were so self-righteous in their own minds that they actually treated others as less than. They had harsh, self-righteous, hypocritical, and unwarranted criticism towards others. I like how D.A. Carson puts it. He says, It's easy to see how powerful and dangerous the temptation to be judgmental can be. The challenge to be holy has been taken seriously in a fair degree of discipline. Service and formal obedience have been painstakingly won. So now I can tell myself I can afford to look down my long nose at my less discipled peers and colleagues. Or perhaps I actually have experienced a generous measure of God's grace, but somehow now I have misconstrued it and come to think that I have earned it. And so as a result of that, I may look negatively at those whose vision, in my view at least, is not as large as my own, or whose faith is not as stable, or whose grasp of deep deep truths of God not as masterful, or whose service record is not as impressive at least in the eyes of man, or whose efforts have not been as substantial, these people are now diminished in my eyes, and I consider their value as people inferior to myself. That's the heart behind this judgmental attitude that we're addressing in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. It's judging character and basing value on people based on our external observations. It's also judging motives of the heart when we have no business doing that in the first place. What the Pharisees did is they they had seen these laws of God these standards of holiness. God says, be holy for I am holy. And they thought to themselves, well, I can't reach that standard. And so let me make this list of 365 other rules and regulations that I can follow. And then I can base my righteousness on how well or how poorly I'm following this set of rules. And this is what happens every time human beings realize that they can't live up to God's standard and then try to address it in their own, in their own way. They create these false gods. And we do this all the time too, just like the Pharisees. We create this list of do's and don'ts, and if we're doing them, we must be good, and if we're not doing them, we must be bad. And in doing that, we have made ourselves into God, who is now the lawgiver and also the law enforcer. We now get to be the judge instead of God himself. And this is what the Pharisees were doing. In fact, they were so bold as to multiple, on multiple occasions, reprimand Jesus himself for breaking these rules that they had established. In John 7, 24, Jesus says, Are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's body well? Do not judge by appearances or simply based on external things that you can observe or not observe but rather judge with right judgment. Right judgment being the actual word of God and standard of God. So what about the rest of these first two verses though? Judge not that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. 
I think there's basically two ways that people have taken these two texts. And the first interpretation would be one that says, basically option one, however you judge others, they're gonna judge you in the same way. So if, basically, if you want other people to be merciful to you, then you need to be merciful first. Or else you're not gonna get that back. It's pretty similar to, to the idea of karma. We don't really believe in karma. And yet so often we live like we do. Next week we're going to get to the golden rule. Whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Kind of a similar thing in that verse as in verses 1 and 2. But it's not that we treat other people a certain way in order that we also receive that from them. We treat other people in a certain way because that's what God has called us to do. The golden rule gives the standard, not the reason for our actions. It's the same here in verses 1 and 2. So I don't believe this option is the best way to interpret verses 1 and 2. I think the other way to look at it is perhaps a little bit more helpful, and it is this idea that however we judge others, God will judge us in a similar way. And this takes a little unpacking as well. Remember back earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Remember back in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, Verse 14 and 15. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. In James chapter 2, verse 13, a whole chapter about showing partiality and judging people based on their external appearances. It says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty or freedom. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so in a similar way to the fact that we don't act towards others in a way in order to receive that same action ourselves, we also don't simply not judge others so that God doesn't judge us. It's not an escape from the judgment that God will give for every sin. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is, is kind of twofold. There's a real sense in which our lack of willingness to show grace and mercy to others is sinfulness, especially when it comes from this type of hypocritical, self-righteous, judgmental type of attitude. And what we know about sin is that sin separates us from God. And so if we have this type of sin in our life, if we're withholding mercy where it should be given, if we're withholding grace where we can give it, to him who knows what to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. And so now we have this separation between ourselves and with God. And that's what we're talking about in passages like the Lord's Prayer at the end of verses 14 and 15. He's not talking about your justification or your salvation. He's talking about that ongoing relationship that you have with Christ in the first place. But even further than that, you could also say that there is a true sense in which this type of judgmental attitude, void of grace and mercy, should not characterize kingdom saints in the first place. It should not be an overwhelming pattern in our life. And so if it is an overwhelming pattern in our life, as with any type of sin, that we are not repented of, that we are not aware of, that we are not actively turning from and resting in Christ and what he has accomplished for us on the cross. If we continue walking in sin without worrying about it or caring about it, we should, in fact, question our very salvation. But we're going to actually get to that in a couple weeks, too, as we're talking about different trees and their fruits and people saying, Lord, Lord, and Jesus is saying, no, I never knew you. 
So we'll, we'll get to some of that. We'll unearth some of that here in the weeks to come. Sinclair Ferguson says it this way. I like this quote. He says, the heart that has tasted the Lord's grace and forgiveness will always be restrained in its judgment of others. It has seen itself deserving of judgment and condemnation before the Lord, and yet, instead of experiencing his burning anger, he has tasted his infinite mercy. And so in verses 1 and 2 in this exhortation, Jesus is not identi- is not concerned with us identifying sinful behaviors. He's not concerned with us discerning truth from error. These are things that we should be doing. What he's concerned with is our hearts. It always has been and always will be a matter of the heart. He's concerned with our hypocrisy. He's concerned with our self-righteous attitudes. He's concerned about our pride. Romans 14, 10 to 13 gives what I think is a good and clarifying passage, especially when it comes to matters of freedom and Christian liberty. In Matthew 14, 10 to 13, it says this, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Some of the things that they're talking about there are these cultural differences between the Jews and the Gentiles. And some of these traditions that the Jews thought, we have to keep on doing this. We have to do it this way. We have this formula. And the, and the Gentiles, meanwhile, were saying, I'm not really seeing that requirement. And so all of a sudden you kind of have this, this tension. And Paul is saying, it's not your job to be the conscience of somebody else. Do not judge one another. Each one will give their own account before the Lord. The idea here in verses 1 and 2 is is this distinction between we should emphatically be exercising careful discernment, but we should not be engaging in judgmental attitudes. Don't be full of harsh, self-righteous, hypocritical, and unwarranted criticism of others. We go then into verses 3 and 4 into this illustration that he gives. And it really is pretty humorous in a lot of ways. And I actually, I actually thought about bringing a 2 by 4 into the auditorium this morning. I totally forgot, but uh, we, could, we could maybe use a music stand and just imagine if I had somebody, in fact, let's just do it. Any volunteers? You, everybody in this church is scared of being a volunteer. All right, yeah, come on up. Let me clear this off real quick. I'll keep your music. No, it was. All right, so this is going to represent our plank of wood. So if you could just hold that up right. Up to your eyes. Can you hold that or is it too heavy? Should I shorten it for you? We'll give you a little grace. Okay. This will be our speck in somebody else's eye. Any other volunteers? Anybody want to have a speck in your eye? Yeah, one of you guys. Come on up. All right, we'll have you sit right here. And you can put that next to your eye. That represents the speck in the eye. So now it is your job, without removing this from your face and without cheating and looking around it, do you need to go remove the speck from his eye? I can't see a thing. Okay. So are you going to try it or not? Uh, okay. We'll see how successful you can be. All the moms are like, what? Okay, so you kind of cheated and he kind of gave it to you. <laughs> Thank you for your participation. You guys, you guys continue to cheat. 
So we, we have this absolutely absurd illustration, right, of the person with the log in their own eye trying to deal with a speck in somebody else's eye. Verses 3 and 4, it says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you don't even notice the log that's in your own? How can you say to your brother, Let me help you with that speck in your eye when there's a log in your own eye? In these verses, we're seeing that if you are participating in this type of judgmental, hypocritic, self-righteous type of attitude, you are going to struggle to clearly see, actually, the sin or even preferences that, other, that you're really concerned about in somebody else. You're not going to see them clearly, first of all. And then secondly, in verse 4, you're also not going to be able to address them and help them in a, in a helpful way until you first remove that log from your own eye. Perhaps one of the greatest examples in Scripture of this is David and Nathan. In 2 Samuel verse chapter 12, you guys might remember the story. David has taken Bathsheba for himself, essentially murdered her husband by sending him out into war, and Nathan has the responsibility has fallen on him to go confront David of his sin. And instead of coming to David and simply saying, hey David, you're a scumbag, what are you doing? He instead comes to him with an alternative example. He says, David, there's this guy in our land who has tons of sheep. He's, he's filthy rich. He has no shortage of anything. And do you know what he did? He went down the street to his poor neighbor who only had one little lamb and stole it right from underneath him and took it for his own. What should we do to this guy? And David said, well, that's terrible. He should die. And Nathan then responded to David and said, you are that man. That is an example of having a humongous log in your own eye and not even being aware of it. You cannot even hope to help those with a splinter in their eye without first dealing with the log in your own. Some practical examples of what I'm calling log in the eye syndrome. We focus way more on the public evil that we see in society around us than we do on our own personal sin and failures. Jerry Bridges wrote a whole book on respectable sins and judging is one of them. We focus way too much on all the evil that we see around us. Oh, everybody's so bad. And we don't ever look within ourselves. Where am I falling short? Where do I need to improve? Where do I need to work? Another example, perhaps every single fight, disagreement, or failed relationship is always somebody else's fault. Another example, you get more worked up over your preferences or the things that you want than you are concerned about who you are worshiping. Another example is a, a quickness to confront others, but extreme defensiveness when confronted yourself. Another example, maybe when you hear a sermon, even like the one this morning, you immediately think, oh, I know who needs to hear this sermon. Oh, I know, oh, that's going to help me really point out the sin in somebody else's. And you're thinking about how you can apply the sermon to everybody else in your life except for yourself. That is log in the eye syndrome. Your judgmental attitude is actually preventing spiritual clarity and hindering you from being spiritually helpful towards others. Verse 5, we have a clarification. He says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. 
What he explains for us here in verse 5 is that the answer to not judging others or the answer to not having log in the eye syndrome is not simply to walk around with the logs in our eye and not talking to anybody else, keeping our six feet of separation or however long our log is. No, the answer is actually deal with the the log in your eye and then go and help others. Once again, we are actually commanded in Scripture to confront sin. Matthew 18, Galatians 6, once again, we we do it in a spirit of gentleness. We do it with a motivation of love. We do it with a desire that that individual would repent of their sin and turn back to Christ. We want what's best for them. But first, before we go and confront somebody else, we first need to examine ourselves. I love James 4, 1 through 4. He says, where do fights and quarrels come from among you? Do they not come from the passions that are at war within you? There's very, very few fights, if any, that are one-sided. Are you quick to examine yourself and cautious, careful, and prayerful when confronting another. Let's not justify our own actions while judging the actions of others. Let's not avoid what Christ has called us to. Let's deal with the logs in our own eye, and then also go and love our brothers and sisters and help them with the specks in their eye. Finally, in verse 6, we have an expectation that Jesus actually gives to his followers. Verse 6 says, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before the pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Verse 1, judge not. Right? People are, we love that passage. We love that portion of one verse. Judge not. Direct those people to the rest of this passage, even all the way down to verse 6, where Jesus here makes a pretty emphatic statement. The expectation of followers of Christ, according to verse 6, is that we should be people who discern. You could even say Christians should actually discriminate. Not in an unjust or unfair or self-righteous way, but we should discriminate from the, from the perspective of being willing to make distinctions between right and wrong, good and evil, light and darkness. We should not be wishy-washy. We, of all people, should be able to identify all of those distinctions, and then organize our time, our energy, and our lives accordingly. If we go back into the Sermon on the Mount, we are called to be salt and light in this world. We're to confront evil. We're to shine light into the darkness, not conform to it. Jesus here calls people dogs and pigs. These are not cute, cuddly puppies that you may have at home. These are not those cute little piglets that fit in a coffee cup that you see pictures of on... I don't know where you see pictures of that. (laughs) Have you guys seen those, though? Those cute little... (coughs) This is not what we're talking about. These are not puppies and piglets. These are wild, untamed, vicious, dangerous, ravenous packs of dogs seeking their next meal. These are the unclean pigs, perhaps even wild boars. They're literally starving. And let's imagine, you, you're, for some reason, you're walking through the woods. You come upon a pack of ravenous dogs and pigs. They're hungry. And so you think, oh, I know. I'll reach into my pocket and give them the most valuable thing that I have. Pearls. That that should do the trick, right? What are they going to do? They're going to stomp those pearls in their own manure and not think twice about them. 
Not only that, but they're still hungry and there's a big juicy piece of meat sitting in front of them. They're going to come after you. They're going to attack you. In Philippians 3 verse 2, Paul says, Look out for the dogs. Look out for these evil doers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. These are false teachers preaching a false gospel. In Revelation 22 verse 15, it says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may be, have the right to the tree of life and they may enter the city by the gates. Outside of this are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Second Peter 2, 2, Jesus, or, uh, the author there actually combines this idea of dogs and pigs. It says, what the true proverb says has happened to them. He's speaking about false teachers there. The dog returns to his own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Dogs and pigs are people who are not only uninterested, but also aggressively and viciously opposed to the truth of God's holy word. They will trample and attack you. And Jesus here says, don't give to them what is holy. Don't continue casting your pearls before them. Essentially, don't waste your time with them. We see this happen multiple times throughout the book of Acts as Paul and his companions are traveling from city to city. They eventually get to a point where there's so much persecution and hatred that it says in a couple different occasions they dusted their, the dust off from their shoes and went to the next place. In Acts 18 verse 6, when they opposed and reviled him, he shook off his garments. He said to them, your blood be on your own hands. I am innocent. For now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Titus 3 verse 10 would commend us to avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. So it's not to say that we shouldn't share the gospel with those who need it. It's saying that when you come and, and you recognize that somebody could fit into this category of being a dog or a pig who couldn't give two rips about the pearls that you're laying before him, this reality of the gospel and the kingdom life that God has available to us, do your job, give it to them, share the gospel, but then move on to somebody else who is ready and, and the spirit is working in their heart to receive it. I would remind you that Paul, the Apostle Paul, who I've been quoting quite a bit in this sermon, was once a pig. He was once one of those individuals literally killing people who believed in Jesus. God can rescue dogs and pigs. He can redeem those people. In fact, Jesus was a friend of sinners. So this verse in verse 6 doesn't mean avoid non-Christians. Get your pole that you just took out of your eye. Don't come close to me. That's not what it's talking about. Go share the gospel with them. Love them. But when they trample on the pearls, don't keep casting them. One author said in some, we are to be careful in our handling of truths and biblical revelation, for they are holy things and must not be thrown around indiscriminately, but thoughtfully, carefully, and responsibly. And so this passage about judging not gives us this exhortation, this illustration, this clarification, and this expectation. Don't be judgmental, full of harsh, self-righteous, hypocritical, and unwarranted criticism toward others. But do be discerning. Do confront sin. Do protect the truth. Do preach the kingdom of God and its surpassing worth in the midst of a self-consumed generation.
a couple thoughts for you to consider as we leave this morning. First of all, where do you tend to be judgmental? You know, some of us Christians, we know that people take this first little nugget, judge not, out of context. And so anytime somebody says judge not, we think, oh, I'm off the hook. I don't have to worry about that. I'm not. Sorry to say, we've got a long way to go. Where do you tend to struggle with being judgmental towards other people? Having that self-righteous, hypocritical, prideful type of attitude that essentially values yourself or sees yourself as better than others. Ask God to transform your heart. Ask God to humble your spirit and ask God to help you genuinely grow in your love for others. Question number two, where do you need to be more discerning? Are there areas in your life where you are not standing firm on the word of God or not submitting to the word of God? Is there sin in your life that you are justifying? Well, this and this. No. Sin is sin. Remove the log from your eye. Are there, is there error in your actions that you're simply dressing up as truth? Question number three. What sin needs to be confronted? First, look at yourself. What do I need to work on? What do I need to confess? What do I need to give over to the Lord? And then, and only then, do we start looking at those around us and graciously, lovingly, gently pointing them towards the truth of God's word. As we do that, we need to desperately ask God for his help, his wisdom, and clarity in a spirit of gentleness in order to do that. So three questions there for you guys to ponder as we leave this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your holy word. We need it. We invite it. And I pray that you would allow us now to apply it to our lives. Let this not be another sermon that we hear are convicted and then forget about it half an hour from now and never change anything, never repent of anything and never work towards resting more in you in order to help us change. We, the Sermon on the Mount is all about kingdom living in the midst of a broken world and we need your radical transformation through the gospel of Jesus Christ to transform us from the inside out. Jesus is the only thing that can rid us of our sinfulness and replace that with the righteousness of God. And so help us run to him. Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' most holy name.